order. You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man. On the eve of a visit by the Pope to Ireland, the first for nearly 40 years, the Irish Prime Minister Leo Varadkar says he's glad the church isn't as prominent in the nation's daily life as it once was. The Catholic Church has been caught in repeated scandals over the abuse of women and children in recent years. From Dublin, our religion editor Martin Bashir reports. Bishops and priests are not usually pounding the turf at Leinster rugby ground. But as Ireland prepares to welcome Pope Francis, it's also hosting this global gathering of Catholics. An altar has been built along the touchline, but that's as nothing compared to the challenge of reconstructing the church after decades of scandal. A lot of the pain and the hurt that we thought we were moving on from has resurfaced, particularly for people who were hurt by clergy in the church. Um, and I think the Holy Father, it's critical that he does something to try and address that. Phoenix Park, another venue, has been under construction for months. The Catholic Church and the Irish government are spending more than £27 million to host Pope Francis. The highlight of this weekend's visit will be here on Sunday when Pope Francis celebrates Mass. 500,000 tickets have been issued. So will Ireland feel like it did the last time the Pope was in town? nineteen seventy nine and pope john paul the second was greeted by the largest gathering of irish people in history back then almost ninety percent of catholics attended weekly mass contraception abortion and divorce were against the law now all three are legal and church attendance is down to forty percent Marie collins story may help explain why she was abused by a hospital chaplain as a child. What has happened here basically is the church has you know, fallen over a cliff. Um, its moral authority is completely uh, destroyed. You know, we still have quite a high percentage of Catholics in Ireland and I think many of them are hanging on by the fingernails. Are you glad that the church is having less of a dominant effect? The short answer is yes. Uh, I think in the past uh, the... Um, Catholic Church uh, had too much of a dominant place uh, in Irish society. Uh, I think it still has a place in Irish society, but not one that uh, determines public policy uh, or determines uh, our laws. Judging by trade in the exhibition hall, the Catholic Church is pinning its hopes on the popularity of Pope Francis. The best one. He remains the star attraction. Of the church. But unless it can convince the world that it has changed, then the future of the Roman Catholic Church in Ireland will continue to be overshadowed by its past. Martin Bashir, BBC News, Dublin. Now, the last time a Pope visited Ireland, it was John Paul II in 1979. Then almost half the population turned out to see him. And back then, around nine out of ten Irish Catholics would attend weekly mass. Contraception, divorce and abortion were illegal. But it'll be a very different island Pope Francis will visit this time. While there, while there will be crowds, they're expected to be well down on 39 years ago. A scandal after scandal has taken its toll on the church's moral authority. Well, Porrick O'Brien is in Dublin. Porrick. Fatima, we're on Sean McDermott Street on the north side of Dublin and a little way down the road on the right hand side, there's one of the uh, now infamous old Magdalen laundries. And in a moment, you will hear the remarkable story of a woman who spent time there. But I should preface that story by saying that when the Pope arrives here in Ireland tomorrow morning, he arrives to a sort of complicated reception. On the one hand, you may be able to see the bunting up around me. There are people celebrating his arrival that will welcome, welcome him warmly, that see this as a, another point on their journey of faith. 
but on the other end of the scale there will be demonstrations and there will be protest and the reason for that in part is to do with the types of story you're about to hear Mary Merritt's story this story is it's not just the story of victimhood hers is also the story of survival it was so cruel I mean we had little or nothing to eat I still weep at night thinking about it. I really, to this day, I do. It was power. They wanted power over, over somebody or other, the church. I blame the whole church for it. I'm very, very sad. I, I, every time I come in here, I get very, very sad. And I Mary Merritt was here. given up as a baby by a mother she never knew. She spent 14 years in the now infamous Magdalen laundries run by Catholic nuns. The bulk of her time was spent at the High Park Laundry in North Dublin. My name is Mary, Mrs. Mary Merritt. My name here in High Park was a tractor. Why, why did you have a different name here? Everybody had a different name. We didn't use our own names. Oh, nobody, nobody used their own names. They took your own name the minute you walked in the door. What happened to Mary was slavery in all but name. Young women walked to the bone. And we've heard the stories of abuse and torture and imprisonment before. But in the church on the grounds of the old laundry, we hear about something sometimes missed the heroic moments yeah. of individual resistance. They gave me a name, Attractor. When you said, did you answer to that name? No, I didn't. I never did. I wouldn't answer to it. Why not? Because it wasn't my name. I wasn't christened Attractor. Whether I was christened or not, I don't know, but it wasn't my name. And when you didn't answer to that, <laughs> Mary, what, how, what, what was the comeback like? What was the response? <laughs> well, they said if I didn't answer to it, I would be locked up down in the hole for a month rather than a day. <laughs> we used to call it the hole, the punishment room. We called and did it that the happen hole. to you? Oh, yeah, several times. I had my hair cut to the bone several times. I broke windows in the cloisters trying to get out and uh, couldn't get out. Of course, the bars were there. I should have known better the bars were there. <laughs> and uh, down again to the cloister, down again to the hole. <laughs> we stayed in the hole for the day from nine o'clock in the morning until five o'clock in the evening. Mary kept trying to escape. Then, one day, when she was in her twenties, she did. So I ended up out on Griffith Avenue and I stopped somebody and I said to them, is there any place where I can get a place for the night and something to eat? And they said, there's a priest's place down the road which was the Archbishop's Palace. Yeah. So I walked in across the cobblestones and I rang the bell, like you do, and it brought me into a side room. And he said, Where, I know you ran out of High Park. He said, sit there and I'll get somebody for you. So a priest came down and before I knew it, he was raping me. And then he had, to, after that, he called the police again to take me back to High Park. Who was that priest, Mary? Um, I don't know because I didn't, never been out in the world, never didn't know anything of the world, so I, I, didn't even, I didn't even have the sense. Today, I regret that one thing, that I didn't get his name. At the age of 31, she was released by the nuns. It was Mary Merritt who walked out the door of the laundry on that day, not a tractor. I wouldn't let them break me because if you saw, if, I always thought as I got older in my brain, in my head, I always thought if you, as I got older, if they see me getting weaker, they'd play on it. I see. And I didn't let them see that I was weak. I see. Yeah, I didn't let them see I was weak. But in the sort of on your own, in the dark of the night? In the dark of the night, yes, I had. And I still weep at night thinking about it. I really, to this day, I do. Do you? Yeah, I'm honest. Yeah. But I'll tell you that. Yeah. I wake up in the night and I really do to this day. Mary also spent time at another laundry on Sean McDermott Street in Dublin. It closed in 1996. Official reports since have acknowledged that women like Mary were victims of abuse. Reports that have outlined state collusion and recommended reparations. Reparation which Mary has also received. Tomorrow in Dublin, though, another chapter. A few days ago, out of the blue, 
Mary received an invitation from the Irish Prime Minister to Dublin Castle during the Pope's visit. The assumption is that she will be one of the survivors of abuse who will meet the Pope, although we can't be sure. If you do, what will you say to him? Well, i would say to him, all I want for the Magdalene women, and I'm saying it on behalf of the Magdalene women, all I need from you is an apology to say that what happened to us and hurt us very much and took all our identification away from us, we only need an apology. And I don't mean to be rude to you, Your Worship, or whatever I'm going to call him. They tell me what to call him up there. And I don't mean to be rude to you, but I would be, it, would, it would bring some comfort back to me and a little, and very little, I would say, belief in the Catholic Church. Before we left High Park, Mary wanted to show us what the building has become. It's now owned by a charity called Respond, offering supported accommodation to the vulnerable. The sort of care she never got here. One last stop, the old Sean McDermott Street laundry, where she also spent time. Five years ago, the sisters of Our Lady of Charity, who ran both laundries Mary was in, said, quote, it's with deep regret that we acknowledge that there are women who did not experience our refuge as a place of protection and care. And outside the old site, the unbreakable woman lets slip something of Ireland's laundry legacy. When you arrive back in Ireland, like you did during yeah, the week, yeah. how do you feel? I felt fear. I always feel fear when I come back to Ireland. And I feel the fear I feel that they're going to lock me up again, if anything. And I always say to my, make sure you don't leave me, stay with me at all times. You say that to Bill, your I husband? I say that to my husband, my, Bill, to my husband. I always say to Bill, so make just sure you clear, stay with me at all times. I got terrible fear in this country that I'm going to be locked up. Orica Bryan there. Well, I'm joined now from Dublin by Michael Kelly, who is the editor of the Irish Catholic newspaper, Reverend Dr. Michael O'Sullivan, and Dr. Maeve O'Rourke, a human rights lawyer with the Irish Civil Liberties Council. Michael O'Sullivan, when you hear the stories of women like Mary from the laundries, raped by a priest, abused by nuns, and there are so many Marys, so many victims of abuse at the hands of the Catholic Church, you might wonder, why would anybody come out to see the Pope tomorrow? Yes, it's absolutely shocking. And really, there are no words to respond to that situation. It's just absolutely shocking, very upsetting. Um, I suppose we have to look and hope that we can now move forward, you know, and that the Pope can somehow, by coming here, uh, take it as an opportunity to move us forward to see that this doesn't happen into the future because uh, it is absolutely shocking and uh, personally I find it very hard to grasp how such atrocities and tragedies could have occurred and on such a scale uh, certainly it's not the, uh, the vision of a Christian faith as it should be lived it's not what Jesus certainly uh, shared with us to live out uh, afterwards so it's completely inauthentic as a way of living Christianity, needless to say. And uh, I believe that there is another form of Christianity to it be lived, an authentic form. And uh, I hope the Pope can help us to see that and to be able to be motivated to live that. Do Dr. Mavo O'Rourke, you've worked with survivors of the laundries like Mary. The church has said sorry in the past. I mean, is that enough? Can that ever be enough? It's not enough. An apology is only the very first starting point. There has to be accountability. The church and indeed the state are still protecting each other in Ireland by keeping all of their records secret. The archives of the Magdalene Laundries, for example, are completely sealed from public view. The Department of the Taoiseach is um, at the moment keeping its own archive of state documents relating to the Magdalene Laundry secret. They're not FOIable. Likewise, the church only agreed to participate in the state's um, inquiry into state interaction with the Magdalene Laundries on condition that it would destroy all copies of the records it gave it and would give everything back to the religious orders at the end of its inquiry. Michael Kelly, that does not sound like a church that is sorry, that is truly keen to make amends. 
I really hope Mary has her opportunity with the Pope on Saturday at the state reception to tell him of her experiences and to, to get that apology. We have had lots of apologies in the past. I think what we need to move now to is uh, concrete actions, concrete gestures, whether that is the files, whether that is further recompense, uh, anything that is necessary there, anything that the survivors feel the need to give them some more peace because this is just a devastating chapter in our history for, for a long period of 20th century Ireland. Ireland wasn't a very nice place to live if you were in any way different or you stepped outside of and societal norms. And there was that cozy many people would coalition argue. between... Sorry to interrupt you, but you're saying it wasn't a very nice place to live, and that was ostensibly, mm -hmm. many people would argue, because of the Catholic Church. How does it continue to have any sway in Ireland? Does it continue to have any sway in Ireland? I think it was because of a kind of cosy consensual relationship between church and state at the time. It, it suited both. The church lusted after power. Uh, the new state, the emerging state, was very, very poor and needed someone to run the institution. So it, it, it ended up with that, uh, that just terrible symbiosis which has done so much damage. This event, uh, Pope Francis in Ireland for the weekend, uh, where they reckon about 750,000 people will, will turn up. That's going to be the largest event in Europe of its kind this year. The faith it continues to play an important role in the lives of many, many people. Ordinary Catholics, Catholics are going to be here where I am in the Phoenix Park for the Mass on Sunday. They're devastated by these revelations. They're sick, sore and tired of their, their, their church constantly mired in scandals of its own making. I mean, they're going to be looking to the Pope. They want the Pope to give a message of hope to the country, particularly the survivors, but also to address just the wider sense of betrayal that is felt in Ireland. Michael O'Sullivan, the problem is it would appear that these are not historical events, are they? We heard how one of the laundries didn't close until the late 90s. And it is the cover-up, as much as anything else, that has absolutely poured salt into the wounds. The Magdalene laundries, babies' bodies left in septic tanks, all of it covered up in the name of the church. Where is the evidence, would you say, that the church has changed? Well, I think the Pope himself is a good man and is committed to changing things. And once he gets to see a situation that needs changing, he really does put himself behind it. He has a history uh, in, say, in Argentina of great concern for people who are poor, people, uh, sexual trafficking as well, as well of women. And he really went behind those issues and pushed forward on them. And I believe that he is now learning. Uh, about the extent of this terrible tragedy and, uh, and set of atrocities that have occurred not only in Ireland but throughout the world and I believe that he will, he has signalled his intent to do so in his recent letter to have nothing uh, barring us from going forward to address these situations and the cover-ups and that and I believe we will see concrete steps being taken by him into the future. Maeve O'Rourke, do you accept it's a very different island than the one the last Pope saw? Do you accept this is also a different Pope? I, I mean, I'd be convinced of that if I saw him give an instruction to all of his bishops in Ireland to immediately open all of their archives to the public in relation to these institutions. There needs to be a place of national commemoration and education. For example, this Magdalene laundry right behind us, Dublin City Council wants to sell it to a Japanese hotel chain, two acres for 14 million euro. It is the only Magdalene laundry remaining in the hands of the state. I think the church in Ireland and the state need to get together to right this wrong properly in the form of accountability and education. Maeve O'Rourke, Michael O'Sullivan and Michael Kelly, thank you very much for joining us. Sorry we couldn't talk more. Thank you. When the Pope lands in Dublin tomorrow morning, he'll arrive in a country, at least spiritually speaking, barely recognisable from the one his predecessor, John Paul II, visited almost four decades ago. Since then, the Irish have voted to legalise divorce, same-sex marriages and abortion. What's more, abuse scandals involving priests and nuns have damaged the reputation of the church. Congregations have been shrinking. John Paul's Mass in Dublin's Phoenix Park drew more than a million worshippers. It is expected that Pope Francis will say Mass in the same place this Sunday to fewer than half that number. And he'll be welcomed by Ireland's first openly gay Prime Minister. That would have been unthinkable at the end of the 1970s. The bunting is out, the flags are flying, anticipation is growing and the merchandise is selling ahead of Pope Francis's visit to Ireland. 
But there is also anger here. Abuse survivors hanging the Vatican flag upside down beside words of protest. This papal visit comes at a time of crisis for the Catholic Church. The scandals of abuse and cover-up leaving it fighting for respect and relevance. It's a good thing the church here needs, needs renewal and hopefully he'll give the inspiration that is required for young people. I was at the last one and um, I enjoyed it so hope it goes all right but no grace, harm to him. That's Thanks. all I'm saying. That first and last papal visit back in 1979 galvanised this country. Pope John Paul II enlivening an already strong church, bringing millions to the streets. I love you. I remember those three words, I love you. And suddenly there was an eruption. Father Michael Murta was newly ordained and among those who travelled to see the Pope. He will do again but he doesn't expect the same reaction. I think a lot of people have lost, have lost trust in us, have lost trust certainly in, in the institution itself. And that's, I think, the biggest challenge facing us. What do you need this Pope to say? I hope he, he addresses the abuse crisis, um, because that's, that's huge. Their pain is horrendous. Um, and I hope it's not just words that there will be action taken. Colm O'Gorman was a teenager when he became one of the many thousands repeatedly abused by members of the clergy. It was a willful, deliberate cover-up that was designed to protect the institution, its power and above all its wealth. So the Pope just needs to tell the truth and acknowledge that because from the truth then all of the other steps that are necessary can begin to happen. Pope Francis will meet with the Irish Taoiseach as part of his visit and will get a clear message on the new position of the church. I think there is a role to play uh, for the Catholic Church in Irish society, uh, but again, uh, one that is part of our society, not one that's at the centre of it, not one that is determining our laws, uh, not one that is determining uh, our policy or medical ethics or school curriculum, um, but one that has a role to play, I believe. In the years since the last papal visit, Ireland's soul has shifted. The church is no longer dominant, and if the Pope wants to build a strong future for his church, he will need to atone for the sins of its past. Emma Murphy, News at 10, Dublin. Now, if there was one country that popes of the past could count on to stick by the Catholic faith, it was the Republic of Ireland. Today, not so much. When Pope Francis arrives in Ireland tomorrow, there'll be every kind of reaction. Yes, there'll be enthusiastic crowds, but also some alternative events and vigils, and perhaps even some shrugs of indifference. The visit almost seems to emphasise just how much of Irish society has drifted away from its religious heritage and catapulted the country into the mainstream of European social liberalism. 35 years ago, Ireland had a vote on abortion. The Catholic Church backed a pro-life constitutional change and it was carried by almost exactly two to one. This year, Ireland voted again on abortion. The voting percentages were almost exactly the same, just the other way round. The church didn't get its way. Ireland was divided in the 80s, it remained divided now, but two thirds were happy to ignore Catholic advice. It's an astonishing change since the era of the last Pope's visit in 1979. A third of the Republic's population were there for the opening mass in Phoenix Park. The next year, a tenth of baby boys born in Ireland were given the name John Paul. What's striking is that that generation has turned out to be less devout than its parents. One reason, no doubt, the succession of revelations of church abuse. We are sick of what's going on within the Catholic Church. A nine-year inquiry published in 2009 found rape and molestation were endemic in certain church-run schools and orphanages. Well, the T-shirt, Leo Varadkar, has said that he's glad the church is less dominant in Irish public life. Let's test that proposition with the Bishop of Derry, Donald McEwen, and Mary Coughlin, a singer, a campaigner, who'll be performing at the Stand for Truth event, which is a gathering in solidarity uh, for victims of abuse. A very good evening to you. Um, Mary Coughlin, you presumably agree, agree with the Taoiseach that it's a good thing that the church is no longer quite as dominant as it was. 
it's a very good thing. Um, I agree with him, and um, there are many reasons for that. And most most of them are the, all the allegations that have been uh, levelled at the Catholic Church. Uh, people know nowadays what happened in Magdalen laundries, what happened in schools, what happened in institutions. Um, Father Eugene Green in Donegal was ra- uh, was accused of and convicted of raping 26 boys. Um, he got nine years in prison. And when Pope Francis had the uh, chance to defrock him, he actually appointed a bishop in a nearby diocese who had been heavily criticised for not defrocking him. The, the situation regarding the Magdalene women remains the same. Mm. The church has never apologised to the women. The orders have not apologised to the women. And the four orders that ran the laundries have repeatedly refused to contribute to the redress Let's, scheme. Let's put and those points. Let's, uh, you've, you've, made, you've, you've made a number. I just want to put those points yeah. to the bishop because I mean, I'm interested in bishop and whether... You, whether you hear what you've said, whether you've heard what's just been said, and whether you think that is one of the reasons why the Catholic Church has lost authority in Ireland. Uh, clearly, that is one of the very significant reasons that gives rise to an enormous amount of anguish and pain and anger across Ireland. And I, I'd be the first to, uh, to, to, to recognise that. Clearly, that's part of a bigger picture as well, um, where I suppose... The, the ideology of any society is the ideology of the ruling class, as old Karl Marx said. There's a new ruling class in place and clearly a new ideology in place. Um, and all the scandals have simply contributed to the dominance of that new ideology and to a huge embarrassment um, and, and humiliation of church in many quarters. That, I don't think, is a bad thing. It may be very painful, but I, I, I don't regret that happening at all. Right, so, so that's the bit I wanted to get you to. So, b- 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 Bishop McCune, are you saying you don't regret, you agree with Larry, uh, Leo Varadka, that the church was too dominant and perhaps even infantilising of people because they felt scared to speak up in the, in the 50s and 60s and 70s? Well, I, I think certainly power corrupts, as we know. Po- absolute power corrupts, absolutely. I, I happen to be living in the north. I've always lived in Northern Ireland, in the UK, and therefore our relationship with the state, the Catholic population's relationship with the state in the north is quite different, in that you were always a minority. And of course we had the, uh, the troubles and a, a much stronger sense of identity. N- nevertheless, any institution that is strong whether you talk about the, the British establishment, whether you talk about the, the Birmingham Six and the blindness, the mistakes there, top Bloody Sunday and the blindness there, power absolutely corrupts. And we found that a very strong church really was, was being corrupted in many ways by people who abused power, thought they were untouchable, thought they could hide secrets and, and took advantage of, of, of particularly the vulnerable. So I, I'm perfectly happy that a church yeah. should be much, much weaker and much more able to offer a prophetic voice rather than be too attached to the establishment. But Mary, what do you make of what you've just heard? Because that sounds like a pretty frank admission of, of, of everything that went wrong in the olden days and a sort of vindication for everything you've been saying. Yeah, but the situation still remains. The Catholic Church have not apologised to the people. They have not, the nuns have not taken on board what the European Court of uh, Human Rights has said about torture and abuse. They have not made any redress to the women. Um, nine young men are buried in a cemetery not far from where the bishop comes from in Donegal in Curtahark, and another one, 16 years of age, all of them victims of sexual abuse by clerics. Right. Let me the ask church... you, Mary. Let me ask you, Mary. Sorry, what you, what role you would like for the church? Obviously, here in Britain, you know, in England, the Church of England is a, it exists in the background. It's nothing like as prominent as the Catholic Church has been, or probably is in Ireland. What, what, what would you like the sort of the relationship to be? Well, I think that uh, Pope Francis is coming. We know that he'll arrive tomorrow. He could have taken a step to meet some of those people. He said he had a very tight schedule, one extra day to meet the thousands of people, the hundreds of women and the hundreds of boys and men who are left in Ireland in perpetual sorrow and pain. He could have taken time out to meet them. And the least they can do is to put their hands up and say, we, we did it, we colluded with the state. Enda Kenny, in 2013, gathered women in the doll, and I was there with some of the women from the Magdalene Laundries. He apologised on behalf of the state. He said that the state actually referred children to Catholic institutions. The Catholic Church has not apologised. They've said they're sorry, but they've actually done nothing mm. about it. Mm. You know, the Pope has an opportunity 
had a perfect opportunity to come here and do something about it. He could have just done that. He doesn't have to say mass okay. to people who believe in, let, in, in the Catholic Church. He could let have me met... Speak, let, let me talk to the bishop again, because, I, I mean, Bishop, what is so interesting is how, among liberals in across the continent, who feel they've had a very bad few years, across the West, really, uh, populist... Uh, uprisings everywhere in the, in the democratic form, um, they look at Ireland and say Ireland's become the kind of the last holdout of sort of pure liberalism. It's become the most, it's gone from being the least to the most liberal state in Europe. I mean, is that how it feels to you? Yes, I, I think you're quite right. And obviously I'm coming, as I say, from the North rather than from the Republic, and I wouldn't know the Republic just as well. But I think certainly there's been an enormous change, as there always is change, in terms of the dominant ideology, uh, the consumerist, individualist ideology, now tends to be the dominant one in most Western countries. And Ireland, in many ways, covered what other countries covered in 50, 60 years, in about 15 or 20 years. And therefore it has seemed to be an, an enormous change in a comparatively short space of time. The strange thing, of course, now, at the present time is that we're finding in some countries that had been going down that route that actually is a swing back from that liberal uh, tendency towards a much more nationalistic inward looking thing so I, I think these things do tend to come in cycles and our job as church is not to defend any position or to defend any terrible errors from the past my job in Derry where we have too many people who are dying from suicide from uh, afflicted by mental illness we're losing too many people for want of a reason for living my job is to try and see how can I proclaim mercy mercy and forgiveness and belonging and hope into a society where in large parts of it there's a sheer lack of hope, lack of confidence, sure. lack of pride in themselves, lack of dignity and the whole Congress on the family that we've had for three days and this weekend is about trying to reaffirm how do we Bishop. put the needs of children above the wants of adults. Bishop and Mary too, thank you both very much. Thank you.